In one of the most infamous crimes to ever come out of Hong Kong, a woman is held captive, severely mistreated, and eventually murdered. However, what made this case so infamous is how they treated her after the fact. Got a pack schedule this fall and don't have much time to figure out what to cook? How about trying some more interesting food that's already chosen for you? With HelloFresh, you can try out a variety of global flavors, all from your own kitchen. HelloFresh offers a wide variety of all kinds of quick and easy recipes that take minimal prep time and don't require much cleanup afterwards. They also always come with clear, step-by-step -step instructions on how to cook the food, and the ingredients are pre-proportioned so you don't have to count anything out. Not only that, but you end up with less trips to the store since it comes with every little thing you need. What I really like is the customization. HelloFresh even works with your schedule to send you meals exactly when you want them. You can change your meal preferences, update your delivery days, and even change your address easily on the HelloFresh app. For this video, I decided to try out the One Pan Santa Fe Pork Tacos, and I've gotta say, these things are amazing. I'm usually not a fan of coleslaw at all, but the way it blends in with these, it, it's just great. This was kind of supposed to be a two-person meal, but honestly, I ate all of it. No shame. Can't recommend it enough. This is a great way to cook at home for minimum effort and maximum output. It gives you a good home-cooked meal with none of the stress. Not to mention you'll cut down on time and you'll cut down on your food waste by about 25% as well compared to grocery shopping. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code DIRETRIP16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 surprise gifts. Once again, go to HelloFresh.com and use code DIRETRIP16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes and 3 surprise gifts. Alright, let me start off by saying that this is probably a case that you've heard about before. It's very infamous. But this is by far and beyond the case I've been most requested to cover. Since it's requested so often, I decided to dig deep into it as deep as I could and give it the whole in full detail treatment. I think that I'll be able to paint a picture as to how truly horrible it really is, and buckle up because it's disturbing. This is the story of a woman out in Hong Kong named Fun Man Yi. Fun did not have the best life, to say the least. She was abandoned in her childhood, forcing her to grow up in an orphanage. However, this would only be until she reached the age of 15, as that orphanage had an age limit in place. Given that she was never adopted and had no place to live, she soon became homeless. Soon after that, she became addicted to drugs. Fan ended up having to resort to prostitution, working at a brothel to get by and even feed herself. When Fan Man Yi was in her early 20s, she was able to get a job as a dancer at the Empress Karaoke nightclub. She eventually fell for one of her clients, who was unfortunately another drug addict who only ended up enabling her. Despite this, they got married in 1996. Her husband, however, soon began mistreating her. Still though, she stayed with the man, and they actually had two sons together over the next couple of years. Their fighting only worsened though. The neighbors would often wake up to not only the sounds of the children screaming, but the sounds of the couple themselves screaming as well as they argued all throughout the night. By early 1997, Van had already started working as a prostitute again out at a brothel called the Romance Villa in Kowloon. After working there for a while, she ended up meeting a 34-year-old man named Chan Man Lok. Chan was said to have been a wealthy socialite well known throughout the area. Fan was immediately drawn to him as she was a prostitute who was addicted to drugs and he was a drug dealer that also worked as a pimp. He would often pay her for long, all-night sessions where they would binge crystal meth, or ice, which he supplied. It wasn't too long before Fan was integrated into Chan's inner circle. She was there along with several of his little underlings, his henchmen, if you want to call him that. Chan Man Lok was a member of the Triads, a large Chinese organized crime syndicate. He wasn't someone to be messed with. Hell, he wasn't even someone you should associate with for your own safety. However, Fan got too comfortable around him regardless. One night, during one of their binges, she stole his wallet, gaining the equivalent of about 4,000 US dollars. That would prove to be the biggest mistake of her life. Chan found out about this and was furious. She agreed to pay him back with $4,000 that she was to earn from her work. He wasn't happy with this, though, and demanded $10,000 of interest. Fan stated that she would need a good amount of time to pay that interest off fully. 
Chan Man Lok was furious about his stolen money. It wasn't even about the money, it was the fact that Fan even had the audacity to steal from him in the first place. In March of 1999, he got two of his men to kidnap Fan and take her back to his apartment on Granville Road. It was a massive apartment consisting of five bedrooms and was all decked out in Hello Kitty merch for some reason. Hello Kitty was on the curtains, on the bed sheets, adorning the walls, and there were even plushies all over the place. Chen planned to pimp Fan out and force her to work non-stop until her debt to him was fully paid off. But he was never satisfied with any amount of money she would earn. He kept increasing the interest on her debt more and more until it became impossible for her to ever pay him back. There simply wasn't any way that she could keep up with the constantly spiking increase to the debt. So, in addition to making her work even more, the gang started taking their frustrations out on her as well. They began to hit her and strike her repeatedly very often. She would often be so bruised and battered that she couldn't even work. Despite this, the group would continue to get high and subject her to even more beatings. They enjoyed themselves far too much while doing so, often laughing at her pain. This was when things got really out of hand, and you may be thinking it's already out of hand, and you would absolutely be right, but it's about to get much, much worse. The group that tortured Fan consisted of Chan Man Lok, the leader, Leung Wai Lung, a subordinate gangster of his who is said to have been either 19 or 21, and Leung Xing Cho, age 26, another one of his underlings. But there was soon one new member to that group, a 14-year-old minor named Ah Fong. She, although she had been reported to be one of the girlfriends of one of his underlings, ended up being a victim of Chan himself as he groomed her more and more over time. This girl, though, despite being very young and obviously manipulated, was ice cold herself. She very much enjoyed helping the group to mistreat Fan. She would even giggle and laugh hysterically while doing so. She took the opportunity to get creative and would even come up with her own ways to brutalize the woman herself. She was always ready and willing to join in. The group, unsatisfied at the amount of money Fan was bringing in, continued to mistreat her more and more. They tied her up, punched her, and kicked her all over. They would force themselves on her repeatedly, as much as they wanted. They even forced her to eat excrement. They started hitting her with metal bars, hit her and stabbed her with kitchen utensils, smashed pieces of furniture over her, and even tied her up in a standing position to use her as a punching bag. It got to the point that, one day alone, she ended up getting kicked in the head about 50 times. It has been said that Fun even got pregnant around this time, but the mistreatment continued regardless. When she was wounded, barely able to even move, the group would rub spices into her open wounds. To further ensure that she wouldn't be running away or moving much at all, they would burn her legs with hot candle wax repeatedly and even melt plastic over her legs. She was then forced to consume even more urine and excrement. The group would then force her to smile and say that she enjoyed all of these things. If she refused, they would just mistreat her even worse, getting even harsher with their punishments. All throughout this time, Fan's husband and kids wondered where she even went. They were left with nothing to do but worry about her and hope that she would come home. The group started getting more and more creative, utilizing anything they could find throughout the apartment that could possibly inflict pain, that could be used as a weapon. They would set plastic straws on fire and press them against the bottom of her feet until they were covered in painful burns and blisters. They would then hit her in the feet with sticks and whatever else they could find. All throughout this, they would throw chili oil onto her wounds and dump oyster sauce onto her face. They then made her drink the combination of oils afterwards. It was a game they played. If she didn't pretend to be happy, then they would beat her harder. They told her to smile while they burned her. It was a fun atmosphere, said Ah Fong. It got to the point where they started using Fan as a toilet, directly urinating onto her face and sometimes even into her mouth. If she spat any of it out, she was severely punished. Ah Fong once even defecated into a shoebox and forced Fan to eat it, which she thought was hilarious. The group started wrapping her in electrical wires and hanging her from a hook on the ceiling. They would then mistreat her in any way that they wanted, usually hitting her with iron bars and leave her there overnight. Eventually, they stopped feeding her entirely. The bodily fluids they would subject her to became her only form of sustenance. 
They continued to pack her wounds with dirt, spices, salt, and really anything else they could find to make sure that she never felt any sort of relief. Needless to say, after seeing the shape she was in, potential clients started refusing her services, meaning that she was no longer pulling in any money for the group. Fun would lie on the floor, starving, drifting in and out of consciousness, while the group hung out and watched TV or played video games. She was broken, and playing with her wasn't so much fun after that, but we carried on anyway, there wasn't really anything else to do, said Ah Fong. Ah Fong would gladly participate in any of the horrible things the group did to Fun, enjoying it all the way, admittedly laughing at everything that happened to her. It was for fun, she later said. The full details of what Ah Fong did herself have never been revealed, but it's undoubtedly a very long list, even by her own admission. One night, the group decided to go out for some drinks. To make sure that Fun couldn't escape, they did what they usually did. They tied her up and threw her onto the bathroom floor, locking the door behind them. This sort of mistreatment could only go on for so long. After about a month of this, on April 15th of 1999, Fun finally succumbed to her wounds and passed away, cold, alone, and in pain while her captors were out of the house. After a few days, the group came back to the apartment. Ah Fong stated that she had to use the restroom. When she went into the restroom, she found Fun deceased on the floor. The men began to discuss amongst themselves. They needed a way to get rid of the body, but they couldn't decide on which method would be best. They even argued about what likely caused her death, obliviously most of them believing that it was probably an overdose that did her in. Most experts agree, though, as you can assume, that it was more likely the actual injuries that led to her death. So, deciding to put a pin in it for now, they decided to go to the arcade and play some video games, all while Fun laid in the bathroom. After a while, they came back home, went to sleep, and did nothing about the problem. The next day, while completely high, Chan came to a conclusion. He gathered up his little posse and told them, now she must be destroyed. They put her into the bathtub and got to work with a handsaw. Once the body was divided up into more manageable portions, they cooked each piece to prevent further decay and to get rid of some of the smell, boiling the pieces on the stove. Chan woke up Ah Fong, who was sleeping, and waved a bag of guts in front of her. He told her to go put them into some hot water to stop them from smelling. Leong Xing Cho was in the middle of boiling the head himself, and called Ah Fong over to come and look at it. She said that she was scared and didn't want to look, but he said, it's okay, just pretend you're watching TV. She decided to give it a peek and decided that, he was right, it looked like something out of a horror movie. Given that this had already taken 10 hours, the group started getting pretty hungry. How they could even get an appetite while all of this is going on is maybe one of the biggest mysteries about this case, if you ask me. While boiling Fan's head in a pot, stirring it ever so often, they decided to throw some noodles onto the adjacent burner. They used the same spoon to stir their soup as they did to stir the head, alternating between the two. By the time their meal was over, the head was now nothing but bone. They decided to take the skull and sew it into the head of one of their Hello Kitty plushies, a large mermaid one. This is obviously where the name of the case comes from. It's still unknown why they even decided to go through the trouble of doing this. Given how drug-fueled the whole operation was, it's safe to say that if there even was a reason, it might not make a lot of sense now. For unknown reasons, they decided to keep some other bits as well, namely a tooth and some organs. However, they disposed of the rest in the apartment complex's garbage. Things were quiet for about a month. It seemed that they had gotten away with all that they had done. That all changed one month later in May. Ah Fong made her way out to a local police station. She told the police that she was being haunted by a ghost, oddly enough. She told the police that this particular ghost had been tied up in electrical wire and murdered. The police, though, given that this was simply a ghost story, didn't take her very seriously at all. They brushed it off, assuming that she was just having nightmares or being silly. This was, however, until Ah Fong told them that she had played a part in the murder of this particular woman. This obviously changed things, drastically. The police asked her for more details and eventually followed her out to where all the carnage took place, the apartment. 
This is where they discovered that her nightmares were very much indeed based in reality. Inside, she pointed them to the Hello Kitty mermaid doll, and inside, they found the skull. The whole group was found, arrested, taken in, and taken to trial. Ah Fong, which likely isn't even her real name, by the way, it's likely a pseudonym given to her by the court system, decided to testify against the other members of the group. She told the police that she was Chan Man Lok's girlfriend, but she was also very likely one of his prostitutes as well. When asked why they had done all of this, she simply said, I have a feeling it was for fun. This case quickly became a spectacle all throughout Hong Kong. Most citizens had never heard of a case coming anywhere near this magnitude before. Being a pretty safe modern city, they couldn't imagine something so sinister going on so close by. One element of this case that fascinated them was the terrifying juxtaposition of one of the most grisly crimes they'd ever heard of meeting with one of the cutest icons they could think of. The mixture of horror and innocence stood out to a good amount of people. The trial would go on to last for six months. Ah Fong went on to testify in exchange for complete immunity. In order to placate Fan's ghost and finally get some peace, she spilled all the greedy details. Every single disgusting detail of every single disturbing thing that the group did. She said that this was in order to relieve her guilt and stop the haunting. During the trial, material evidence relating to the case was presented to the courtroom. This included the refrigerator where the body was kept, the pots used in the cooking, and the actual skull itself. It has been said that the stench radiated throughout the entire courtroom. Psychiatrists evaluated the three men, who went on to describe them to the courts as being completely remorseless. There was one massive roadblock to the case, though. Given the way that Fan's body ended up, there wasn't any clear, for sure reason to find out what actually had happened to her. They couldn't come up with a concrete cause of death, given the evidence that they had to go off of. It could have been from the abuse, or it could have actually been due to an overdose. As a result, the men weren't convicted of murder, but instead of manslaughter. The jury had come to believe that they had indeed caused her death, but they couldn't agree on whether or not there was intent. They couldn't rule out that the men did intend to kill her, but they also couldn't rule out that they didn't. There was simply no way to know for sure. Despite all of the doubts and the charges being reduced to manslaughter, the court justice, Peter Nguyen, was having none of it. In December of 2000, he sentenced the three to life in prison. Sadly enough, though, this sentence did come with the possibility of parole. It wouldn't be for 20 years, though. Never in Hong Kong in recent years has a court heard of such cruelty, depravity, callousness, brutality, violence, and viciousness, he said. The public is entitled to protection from people such as you. While if this had taken place in mainland China, all three would have likely been executed pretty swiftly, Hong Kong did not have a death penalty. Fan's husband came out and spoke of the sentencing. It seems that he was satisfied with them getting life in prison. He did, though, end by saying, But how can I ever forget? Ah Fong was released, free of charges, into foster care. It's currently unknown where she is now or how she turned out. The lawyers of the three men tried to appeal the case in 2003, but they had no luck. The sentence was upheld. Those three monsters weren't going anywhere. In 2014, the courts finally handed Fun's skull, the only remaining evidence of her body, over to her family, who had it cremated. The apartment building, located at 31 Granville Road, Sim Sha Tsui, Hong Kong, where the murder took place, was eventually demolished entirely in September of 2012. After several years, in 2016, it was rebuilt as a hotel that still exists to this day. The actual location where the murder took place is now, by some dark irony, a restaurant. 20 years came and went, and in 2020, it seems that the trio never did get their parole, as there's no news out there of their release. That is, except for one of the men. Leung Xing Cho was actually released in April of 2014. It seems that his lawyer was able to appeal and convince the courts that there wasn't sufficient evidence against him. As you might assume, it wasn't too long before he was on the police's radar again. Just recently, in January of 2022, while he was working as a waiter, he groped the chest of a female minor, only 10. 
And even more recently, he was sentenced to 12 months in prison for that. So as of the writing of this video, he is back in prison. Time will tell if they end up seeing parole in the future. There ended up being a few movies released throughout the years that told the story of this case. One of them was called Human Pork Chop with, my god, have some tact, come on. Another was called There's a Secret in My Soup. This case even became well enough known overseas that it was featured in an episode of Bones, an American crime drama. To this very day, Fan Man Yi's memory is kept alive every year when citizens of Hong Kong celebrate her life on her birthday with a candlelight vigil in the center of the city. Once again, thank you for watching my videos. If you found it interesting, please give it a like. It helps me out in the algorithm. And if you find content like this enjoyable, feel free to subscribe. If you don't mind, go ahead and follow me on social media. I mean, you know how YouTube is with content like this. If anything were ever to happen to this channel, that'd probably be the only way you'd ever hear about it. If you feel like supporting the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I keep linked down in the description below. There you can get videos both early and uncensored. Speaking of which, shout out to my top patrons. Starfade, Astral, Raven, Entrepreneur, Grack, El Palmieri, Salad, Kevin, AMCMT, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankis, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Marsh, Buffazerk, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lex Luther, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Main, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. All of you are my favorite. Thanks again to HelloFresh.com for sponsoring today's episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the description below. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.